So he's he's seen the NASCAR fights. Like these NASCAR fights are wimp fights, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's like a little bit of uh, 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 and then somebody gets in and pulls them apart. Yeah, right. So he's like, I'm tired of seeing that. Shit. I want to see somebody just pull up and clock the dude, you know? So I always remember that. I'm like, all right, do it. <laughs> Kyle Bush, Rowdy. Yeah, man. I've heard Rowdy for months out of Brandon. Just got in the NASCAR, Rowdy. In my mind, Rowdy means asshole. I'm an asshole. Okay. Rowdy. And we're friends. Rowdy, are you an asshole? I am. I've been known to be quite the uh, the big butthole. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and does, should he embrace it? Embrace it. And he has embraced it because yeah. in every sport, no matter what you do in life, you have to be the villain. It's okay to be the villain. The villain at times is glorified and hated by many, but it's a great role to have. He's speaking from experience right there. Yeah. He knows the role. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that I do. That's why I love you and the way you carry yourself, your aura, your energy, your fuck you, excuse me, type mentality when it comes to racing. Sometimes that's what you got to do. I mean, you're all out there competing. I mean, it's a challenge, right? You guys have been in competition before, and so you understand what it takes when you have to beat the rest of the competition that are out there, whether they're on other teams. You want to be better than everybody else statistically, but then you also got to beat uh, the defensive side, you know, which on our, on our front with NASCAR, you got to beat the rest of the other 39 competitors that are out there. And that was one of the things my dad taught me when I was young was we always went to the racetrack. We went to the racetrack. We were kind of by ourselves in our own little circle doing our own little thing. And we were racing against the competition. And I never kind of really understood why I didn't have friends at the racetrack. And my dad was like, you bring your friends with you. Like you're competing against the rest of those guys. They're not your friends. Trust me, when you get out there on the racetrack and you're racing against one of those guys and he runs into you or whatever, or there's mistakes made, they ain't gonna be your friends very long, so you might as well just not befriend them. That was his, that was his philosophy anyway, so. What, what do little kids do outside of the track on, on the, uh, the day of the race? So I'm learning a little bit different perspective of that now, me being a dad and my son getting into racing and starting racing, where he likes all those kids and they run around and play together. He's five, he's five, six years old. So it's still supposed to be fun right now and not competitive, although when Brexton finishes second, he absolutely, hates it he cries you know he doesn't like it uh he wants to win but um hmm, you know sounds familiar he, it sounds very yeah. <laughs> just like his mom <laughs> don't put samantha in this no uh, samantha sweet that's why i fell in love with you guys and fell in love with the sport you know my first time out 2019 um daytona 500 yep, that's right and uh, had an amazing experience. And your wife, she brought me into, what, is, what do you guys call it? It's called the, the pit box. The pit box. Yeah. And she just, you know, let me l listen in. And I heard you. I heard the team. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. So Samantha is not like you, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're, uh, you're painting a pretty picture. She is very beautiful inside and out. So she, right. she does a great job and trying to raise our son right. But uh, it's been fun. You know, the, the whole racing thing for years, I'm... There's a lot of you guys that have kind of picked up on it over the years. Um, I know Camara's kind of getting into that's it a bit, right, and so right. he's taking a, a bit more of a liking to it and understanding about it. And it's just so, there's so many things. Like we could sit here and talk for an hour and you would probably know less than 1% of what our world is all about. And that'd probably be the same thing for me, you guys explaining it from NFL so side. So with, with, with that, with that, um, your football knowledge, mm -hmm. you, you have a team? Like, do you follow football? Yeah, no, I, I football's my team. My favorite sport besides what I do. Um, so I've been a Denver Broncos fan for forever since I was a kid. I met John Elway back, yeah, I know this guy, back when uh, I met John Elway back when he was in Vegas uh, at an autograph signing. He was with the Auto Nation car dealership mm -hmm. things or whatever. And so I, I met him, got a ball signed. This was like 90, 96, 97. So right around their championships, right? Just, just before. You're 6'1", 185 is what I saw. Yeah, I'm about 199 now. Yeah, I've, okay. I've chunked so up a, a little. So you're a big receiver like this guy. Yeah. Um, so you know the receiver position. So they've been running around North Carolina. Who's the X? Who's the Z? The X is usually the better receiver on the field. Okay. All right. 
We're going to give you the last same vote. Are you talking about X, Y, and Zs like on, uh, right. on Xbox? Well, is that exactly. what it is? Like you have three receivers right. on the field. Yeah. It's, it's the same, the X, and Y, the Z. X, Y, Z, or not? Correct. Yes. Yes. Right, correct. Yes, that's universal. So Z right slot guy? No, Z is outside. Uh, the Y, the H is slot guy. Okay. You know, X is backside, short side of the field. Got to have it moment. Big time Denver days. Yeah. You know, sure. moments. Be, moments? Moments. Moments. Who are you going with? Everybody else in North Carolina. I don't think Cutler knew there was another player on the field when you were there. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> you were watching. Yeah. Yeah. He knew his go-to. Yeah, that's right. Let's get to it. But if he had to pick X, I think he's going to go with the person that played the game the same way he races. That's tweetable. It's that like, it's like, that was a good one. Bar. I, I, I might one. pick you after that. that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about 20 to 10 in Ocho's favor. In North Actually, Carolina. It's 20 to 7. No, it's not 20 to 7. Let's just 20 say 20 to, to 10. You have the, 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 the winning vote. You have the winning say. We'll, whatever you say, uh -huh. is that's how we'll go and, home. And we're not sensitive. You're asking me who the X we're is between these two? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus. Exactly what I'm asking. I got to go with the height. Bam. 20. I mean, he's a, he's a baller, though. He cuts, real, he cuts real good, but... When you're looking for that end zone, man, you got to get up above. But that's why I score from out. Do you have higher have... hops than he does? Yeah, of course. He can't even jump. <laughs> what makes him good is he makes it look good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But jumping higher, running faster, I'm right there with him. Okay. Huh? He's like, what? That's another story. Like, I want to talk about parenting. Okay. Parenting as a, as, a, as a father, because I'm a father of 85. And I, I don't... Of 85 kids? Kids? Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. Serious. You didn't know that? I did not know oh, that. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about it off, right. off camera. But as, as a father, I am not one that pushes my kids to do anything. I don't force them. I don't try to live vicariously through them at, at anything. And I allow them to, um, what's, for back of letter terms, go and do what they want to do mm -hmm. without having to force the issue. As a, as a parent, do you force your son, Braxton, to you have to race, this is what you have to do, or do you just allow him to enjoy it and have fun and just experiencing what racing has to offer at an early age? Yeah, so I've, I was ever since, people ask me, they're like, well, is your kid gonna be a race car driver? And I'm like, no, he can be whatever he wants to be. Okay, okay. I, I don't care what he wants to be. And if he picks up on the interest and, and the vibe of, of wanting to try racing and get into it, then we'll do it and we'll see how it goes. And so um, with, with, uh, with, with the world being shut down and Corona happening and all that sort of stuff, uh, I had a lot more free time and time at home and stuff like that. And so what we, Brexton and I ended up doing was we went to the go-kart track and just watched some of the races and we we're checking it out. And he was like, dad, can I do that? And I'm like, well, yeah, if, you know, you can do it at five. So he was five. And so we ended up borrowing a guy's car. He got out there and he was learning the ropes and driving around and checking it out. And um, he enjoyed it, he liked it, you know? And so then I went out and bought his own car, and so now he's racing himself. Two cars. And so, huh? Two cars. He's got a back. Yeah, he's got a primary and a backup car. Yeah. And Uncle Greg, his own chief crew. Uh, yeah. Crew, crew chief. chief. Crew yeah. chief. Yeah. yeah. Braxton's yeah. got his own crew chief. Yeah. He's got the car owner. He's got sponsors. Like he's. Uh, oh, serious. Oh yeah. He's, oh, he's loaded. He brought in his own money. Yeah. I haven't paid anything for it. He sponsors. He's got he sponsors. Won his, he won his first his first race last year. Yeah. First he year won. Out. Um, so his first year out. They have a uh, they have like a, a really beginner class. It's called the cadet class, and so we put him in that. And he won he won four races in that division last year, and so we got into what we were going to do for this year. And they made mention to us. They were like, "Hey, if you win three races this year in that cadet class, then what we're we're going to automatically bump you up to the next class. Like we're not going to let you stay." And so we were like, "Okay, well, he'll win those three races in probably five weeks. So we might as well just run in the next class up. That's where we're at right now." And something something that we talk about. And B talks about it all the time with his with House of Athlete, I'm Athlete, the empire yep. he's trying to build. Yep. We're sitting in your empire. That's right. Do you do you he struggle? Said, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I already say the assholes, so I love it. I love every response. But like, do you do you struggle with the ba your, your son, the kids, the wife, all that stuff, and having an empire like this? Uh, like time management? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Balance. Yeah, absolutely, no question. I mean, just before this, Samantha and I were doing some some personal stuff, and then obviously coming here and you know, having to let her kind of go off and do her thing and me come over here. But I mean, that, that's, that's a part of it. We've, I mean, I've been doing this since I was 16, 17 years old and she came into the fold in 2007, eight timeframe. And so we've, that's all we've known ever since. So, yeah.
I mean, it, it is a interesting conversation. On our show, we always talk about, you know, we call them evergreen topics, something that everybody can relate to. Yeah. Um, no matter who you are, what you do. Um, and that's a big one. And we talk about it. We, 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 we have a show called I Am Woman. And um, they're hitting all these topics, but work-life balance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big deal. And you walk in here and we're talking about KBM. You have two full-time drivers running the truck series and you have your own, you're still active and still getting after it. You know, so how do you manage work-life balance and do you still struggle? Uh, you know, who came along and showed you like, this is how you're supposed to do it? Well, yeah, so the work-life balance thing for me just, um you know, trying to have the opportunity to come here as much as I can. This place probably actually gets the least amount of attention um, from myself. So when we built this place and started Kyle Busch Motorsports back in 2010, I had a couple really good guys that I hired on. And so they, you know, I was here a lot in that time. And I mean, shoot, almost every single day. And as time wore on and as I kind of like started to turn things over and let, let go of the reins a little bit, um, I let those guys kind of take over and, and, and run it, and it's been self-operating pretty much since. So the tough questions, the hard decisions, the, the budgets and things like that, obviously that still has to go through me. Um, but, you know, Eric Phillips is one of our crew chiefs here, and he actually was with me in 2010 when I started this place. He went off for a couple of years to go try to do some, some crew chiefing at some other places, and um, I... I talked him into being able to come back because right. uh, we lost our guy that was here last year to a, another Cup Series team, so he he went up the ladder, right. and so um, Eric, you know, I got Eric back, and and so I feel like we're in a really good place here. So the the thing that gets the most attention that I try to give the most attention to is Samantha and Brexton, Brexton's racing, and then my racing, obviously, but going to Joe Gibbs Racing, I'm there every week. You know, we have our team meetings and all that sort of stuff that we sit down and talk about uh, what happened in the previous week, what we could do better. Like, we don't necessarily sit and watch film together, but we kind of go over what went down right. in order to improve for the next time we go back. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where I'm at right now with with that stuff, and then um, this got thrown into the fold, the Rowdy Energy drink and that business and starting that and getting that rolling. Um, but I hired a, um, a CEO in order to kind of, a guy that's been in the beverage industry for 25 years, I hired in order to run that thing. Cause I'm like, look, I'll put in the capital, I'll give you the, the branding and the ideas and, and some of my stuff, but you have to really be able to take that and, and run with it. So I try not to put too much of that on my plate. Are you a perfectionist? Oh yeah. I walk it. Yeah, because yeah. oh, yeah. I walked into Can you your... tell? Right. I mean, this place is halfway clean right now. It's not very clean. That's interesting <laughs> because when I walked in, the attention to detail, I mean, it's like an Apple store. It's clean. It's immaculate. You walk into the garage. I mean, you can eat off the floor. And I said, this is a dude who is probably obsessive yeah. and a perfectionist. And that was one of my questions, but you already answered. You said, yes. Um, you know, is that one of the reasons why, you know, you're considered one of the greatest drivers ever? Oh, I don't think, I don't think, me being a perfectionist, I don't know if that has anything to do with me being a good driver or not, but it probably does in the sense of um, you want to hit all of your marks perfect every single lap, every single time, and kick everybody's butt, but right. you're not always going to be exactly perfect. Right. You know, you're going to have a lap where you get loose and you slide up the track and, and somebody gets by you, but then you want to be able to get back into the rhythm and get back by them. It'd be, it'd be kind of the same as you guys. Like you want to run the perfect route every single time and not miss a step where you want to put your foot and where you want your hands to be when the ball's delivered and that sort of thing. So that to me is, you know, guys can run routes and they can run them sloppy, but they're going to be incomplete. You know, they're going to get, <laughs> they're going to get their, their ass flattened. Right. You so, know, when the ball comes down. So it's, it's, it's similar to those things. Like we have the same stuff here, you know, and I harp on these guys, you know, if, if you're buying stuff and you're spending your own money, even, even though it's my money, but I tell them, I'm like, look, <laughs> you guys are working here. Like this is your craft. And this is, this is not, not just me, right. but this is you too on everything that we do, you know, like those guys. So I don't know what their houses look like, if they're sloppy or pigsties or what, but here it ain't gonna look that way. That's right, I mean, that's like Bill Belichick, do your job and in attention to details, it's all of that. And before, I knew you wanna hit that, I just wanna just, cause we didn't really cover rowdy energy enough and you know, wanted to stick on business a little longer. I mean, this is a crowded space. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you got Monster, you got Five Hour Energy, you have Red Bull, you have Bang Energy. What's your differentiator like? Yeah, so um, years ago, I've, I've been in the energy drink space for 14, 15 years oh. being with um, a sponsored athlete with Monster Energy, with NOS Energy. And so back to Monster, back to NOS, back to Monster, like they kept switching me back and forth. Um, and I had my own flavor at one time with NOS Energy Drink and it was doing okay, it was selling all right. And we got to do the whole flavor tasting and the development of what I was looking for and that sort of thing. And it was really fun. But one of the key things that I remember from that meeting was the guy who was the president of the company, he made mention, he was like, you know, we got this NOS Energy Drink brand just thrown on us because there was a Coke and Monster acquisition that happened and Coke owned NOS. So they basically just turned over the energy drinks to Monster to run. And so anyway, the guy was like, you know, you want to name this drink Rowdy, like Rowdy Punch or whatever it is. And he's like, Rowdy actually sounds like a hell of a lot better energy drink name than this NOS thing does. Right, right. And so boom, that always stuck in my mind. Like, hey, if there's ever an opportunity there, if I ever go down that path, I, I feel like that guy actually made Monster what Monster is. Monster Energy Drink, before it was Monster, was actually called Hansen's Energy Drink. That's terrible. And it didn't sell. Of course it And didn't. they didn't change the formula at all. All they did was rebrand it to the Monster stuff, and it, boom, took off and blew up. It's all wow. branding. Yeah. So anyways, there's a part to that where, yes, it's all branding, but to how Rowdy is different, let me get into that, is we went after the white space. What is everybody doing and what aren't they doing? What is nobody else out there doing? Well, nobody else is out there doing clean energy. So we have no synthetic ingredients. Everything is all natural. And we also added in the electrolytes with potassium and magnesium, and we didn't just fill it full of sodium. Because um, obviously, like you guys would know, if you don't work out more than an hour a day and sweat a ton, you don't need a whole lot of sodium, you get plenty of that in your normal diet. You know, we've made a low-cal line, which is a 60% less sugar, but then we also have the, the zero sugar, but it's still five calories because you can't get rid of natural calories in fruits and stuff like that that we have in, inside the drink. So, um, yeah, I mean, so that's what we went for. We just went for something that was healthier, better for you. My wife, she never drank an energy drink, never wanted to touch one. And so when we were doing this project, she was like, well, hey, you know, are, are you going to make this where it's something that I can drink. Like I wouldn't, I would like to, to drink something that tastes good. That was another thing is we had to work on the taste. Um, and so that's why it's, it's all natural and she feels comfortable drinking it. Um, and then the other things that are out there that are on the market that are all natural, that are healthy for you, they taste terrible. Yeah. I mean, we had 40 different energy drinks lined up on the table and we were doing a taste test on trying to figure out like what we wanted to do and where we were looking to go. And some of those were just bad, brutal, brutal, like, terrible bad. I'm like, I don't even know why the buyer bought them to put them on the shelf. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, that was one of my things was I was like, look, it's going to, it's going to say what it tastes like and it's going to taste like it's supposed to taste like. Right. So that was a big thing too. So I feel like we've done a really good job on that. And now we've built into the distribution model and, and we're getting out to more stores. We'll be in about 20,000 stores right now. And hopefully by the end of the year, it'll be about 30,000 stores. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's growing, it's good. Is Brexton one of your uh, athletes? He is, yeah, yeah, Brexton's a rowdy athlete. Yeah, he don't get paid though. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple guys in the sprint car world. We got uh, Brian Brown and Rico Abreu. Um, and then we've also, I've been talking to a couple of guys on, on the NFL side about trying to do something with them, but they're all... Uh, they want that money? They're all wanting some money, some are, big, are, some are big you, money. Are, are you talking any equity? I did talk equity. And they didn't take the equity? Nope, they wanted the money over the equity. Wow. They don't see the bigger picture. Well, yeah, I'm not going to say their name. I was going to say their <laughs> name, but I'm not going to say <laughs> no, their name. No, you can't say their name. <laughs> yeah, all right. They're all making right. pretty big money, so it's like they don't need the money. You know what I mean? Correct. So. No, I love what you're doing. So, you know, Chef Nancy, you've watched our show before. Yeah, you've I've seen, seen it. Bubba on. Yeah. Obviously, we're in your town. What do we have here? Um, what do you got for us? Uh, so this is Mr. Peter here. So Mr. Peter was kind enough to uh, make us a lunch similar as those that would be made for the team guys. You know, we all have our haulers that were embedded in in the garage area, and there's 40 different team haulers in there. So they all have to cook on the grills or in the crock pots or whatever it might be in order to make a meal. So Mr. Peter did, uh, did us some, some chicken, some potatoes, some corn. Cornbread and, and rolls and... Uh, Chocolate chip cookies. 
Oh, chocolate chip. You didn't make the chocolate chip cookies, though, did you? Oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> so you drive and get on that grill? Yes. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we just, awesome. everyone just got to do what they got to do. Everybody just dip pitches in and do what they got to do and make it happen, man. It's, it's all team effort. That's how, right. how, how long have you been with uh, KBM? Uh, a little over a year now. About a year, a couple months now. How long have you been associated with Kyle, though? Uh, probably 15 years. Right. At least 15 so years. So he was my truck driver in uh, 2008 when I joined JGR, yes. right? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So when I got to Joe Gibbs Racing, Peter was there. So he was my truck driver on the M&M's team for, for a long time. And then he went off and did some other stuff with some of the other teams at our place. And then uh, now, he's, now he's over here at, at, at KBM at my place. So, yep. And very and glad to be here. He's a great guy. Well, great guy. hey, don't, don't, no, I'm not a asshole, remember? <laughs> right. Yeah, give us that story. Like, we want to hear that. Like, why, like. Oh, can, I, can I tell you a story real quick? Go ahead. Do it. When him and Juna got together at Richmond. Oh, yeah. And they started spinning and the smoke was clearing. I'm saying to myself, oh, boy. So Joe and a bunch of... He's got to drive the hauler out I gotta after get out the of race, there. right? Yeah. So like all the fans are there on the side of the road and they're just going to give him shit the whole time when he's leaving. So like he was in more danger than I was, really. What, what year was that? 2008. Yeah, that was 2008. And we had Junior on, uh, what, a week ago? And Junior, Junior said um, that he feels like that was the moment where this rowdy and this villain came to life yeah because like you did it, he feels like you did it on purpose he's so full of he <laughs> went no listen he he, he he took us through the backstory he was like basically you were leaving hendrix motors right yeah that's right hendrix um and, and like he was coming in and he was coming in you felt like he took you felt let's, like he took your car let's tell the story so yeah tell the story because he told us too so we want to see yeah we'll see how they jive right right right, right. so in 2000 yeah 2000 i was in hendrix from 2005 six seven and during that time frame, I was a little bit of a punk and I'd give my, make myself an idiot on TV here or there or whatever. And so I had Kellogg's as a sponsor and they didn't really like that too much. They, right. they wanted a more wholesome type guy. Oh, that's boring. And whatever, and whatever right? So, yeah. Um, and so, anyways, I was going to lose my sponsor. So that was essentially going to lose my job. But Junior was also leaving DEI and trying to find somewhere that he was going to go and have his new home to race. And so him coming in, me having kind of a rough patch going, it was easy for them to say, Kyle's out, over the other guy that, hadn't, that was there. They kept another guy that ain't never won a cup race. I was, already, I was a winner. Like I was a four-time winner in the cup series, and the other guy never won a race. So they kept him over me just because he could fit the sponsor. Kellogg stayed with that other guy. No, so he gave us that story, but let's fast forward to the season. He felt like you were salty. You got oh, sensitive. Oh, I was way salty. Oh, yeah. So you were. Oh, yeah. So, so, so did you wreck him on purpose? No, I did not wreck him on purpose. Oh. No, I did not. Because after that, it was just on. And, and, and what's cool about the story is, you know, and I, and, I mean, I would love to hear you finish the story. You know, I want to see how the next couple years went. But he said when he was done, he started his podcast, and he was like, yo, we, we need to connect, we need to talk. And you guys sat down like men and hashed things out. And now you guys are good. He said, you guys text now. Yep. Um, and our friends bounce things off of each other. Yeah. But before you get to that end part, like I want you to finish the story because he said, you know, he, he wrecked you on purpose Yeah. after that. Yeah, well, <laughs> so back up a second in 2007, when all this talk was going on about where's Junior going, what's, where's he going to go, where's he going to end up, there was, a, uh, there was a wreck at Texas Motor Speedway in April or May or something like that. A guy spun off the corner, made a ton of smoke. Nobody could see anything. Junior was leading, I think, and I was second or something, and, and I didn't slow down fast enough, and I ran into the back of him in, in the smoke and destroyed the front of my car. So I had to go to the garage area, and my guys had to fix it, whatever. Well... One of the team members told me, they said, man, it, that thing's hurt pretty bad, and I don't know if we have enough time to be able to get it back out there, so, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to continue. Right. So I'm like, okay. So I changed my clothes. I got in my rental car. I left. Well, they were still working on it to fix it. They ended up getting it fixed with eight laps to go. They couldn't find me. They didn't know where the hell I was. I was at the airport waiting to go home. <laughs> And so Junior was there who crashed out. He was still there walking around or whatever. I don't know what he was doing. So they got him and they put him in the car, my car, 
to finish the race. So Junior ran the last eight laps of the race in my car. That's not, that's a no-no? Well, it's just not normal. Like, I, I don't know, like, because I wasn't there and those guys worked so hard to get the car ready to go, I guess they decided that they just needed to get it out there and, and run the last eight laps of the so race. So was that a F you to you? Like, I mean, because is that, is that not, like, driving etiquette? <sighs> well, is that team etiquette? Right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I take it for so what it's you're, worth. So basically you're saying that's where it started? That that was that was a start of it. I didn't have any hard feelings to Junior for doing that. I we had I had more hard feelings with my team for why the hell did they call upon who another ma- guy when they told call? me they weren't going to fix it? Right. Who makes that call? Crew the, chief. The crew chief makes that call, but I listened to one of the other guys that was below him. Right. So, uh, anyways, later that year, fast forward to Kansas, which is in October. I'm third in points. I'm having a pretty decent year. I know I'm leaving already because I signed a deal with Gibbs in August. So. This is October time frame, and we're running at Kansas. I'm running third in points. I think I'm running fifth in the race, and Junior's behind me, and we're, we're racing, whatever, and we come off a of turn two, and I drive up to the wall, and he's got to run off the top, so he's got more momentum than I do, and he drives right up underneath my back bumper and jacks me up off the ground and basically makes me fishtail down a straightaway, and then I, I can't catch it, and I ended up hitting the wall, and I was out. Like, I was out on that one. I made sure to stick around and them to tell me that I was done on that one. Um, But anyway, I crashed out, and that basically cost me any chance that I was going to have left at being able to win the championship that year. And so that's where that's where it was like, okay, there's 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 something going on here, right? So when we were racing at Richmond, I was racing him really hard. He was racing me really hard. But what happens in those moments when you're racing against guys that you don't necessarily like? you don't give them an extra inch. Like, you're not just going to be like, ah, I don't want to hit that guy. You're just going to be like, like the whole time trying to pass him. And if you make a little bit of a mistake or you slip a little bit and you hit him, who cares? (laughs) So you guys are going 170 miles per hour. At Richmond, nah, we were only going like 100. Really? Richmond's a short track. So 120 probably at the end of the straightaway and through the turn is probably 90 miles an hour. Okay, but finish, but it's not normal, but go ahead. So I, yeah, I mean, I just, I dived underneath him getting into the turn and I got loose and I had to turn to the right in order to catch it and he's on my outside. So it just, we, I ran into him. I slipped, you know, I didn't, I had no care in that moment. You know, if I was racing a teammate or somebody that I actually respected and liked, I, I wouldn't have ran that hard probably and slipped. So, so, all right, now let's fast forward to, you know, I, I'm assuming he called you or text you, had his people reach one? out to you. No, when he left the game, 2017, Thanks, I don't know bro. when you guys connected and you sat down on the podcast and talked things out. Um, that was grown men business right there. Yeah. A lot of dudes don't do that. Uh, Why'd you pick up? Yeah. Huh? You could have signed us this call. What, on Junior? Yeah. When he called me for the podcast thing? Yeah, and like he wanted to talk things out, make sure you guys were good. Oh, clearly. damn, that was, we were, we were on talking terms way before he called me about the podcast anyways. Okay. So, I mean, over time, so in 2008, 9, 10, 11, like, yeah, we hated each other. You know, we really didn't talk a whole lot. I avoided eye contact and all that sort of stuff. Like, you just don't want to talk to that guy. I've got a couple of those right now that I do the same we thing. We want to get on that. We want to get on that next. We'll go ahead. <laughs> but uh, but Junior, you know, over time, he, he then got girlfriend, got married, and then um, we were at NASCAR driver functions together. And so we started talking. The wives started talking. Like, we were cordial with each other, but we weren't, we live in Mooresville together, but we weren't necessarily going to text each other up, hey, you want to go to dinner tonight? Yeah. You know, but um, it just kind of, I guess we just kind of got over it together. Right. And um, I don't know what the turning point was. It just kind of evolved. And then when we had that, um, it was the 10-year anniversary. So it was 2018 when he texted me and says, hey, we should do a, a segment on my show about the Richmond deal. It's 10 years. And I'm like, yeah, man, let's do it. You, you want to hear the truth? Let's, let's hear the <laughs> truth. <laughs> right. Let's right. put it all out there. Wow. So that's when we sat down and, and hammered it out. That, I think for people that don't watch NASCAR, and when you think about it, as Shannon would describe, all they're doing is going fast, <laughs> turning, turning left. left. Stuff like that, like between you and Dale or any other altercations or just small mishaps or mistakes, it makes it exciting for people that aren't fans of NASCAR. Right. 
because I got into it not because they're going in circles and I know about cars and engines and speed, but because of the altercations. That's right. Seeing something on ESPN, a driver gets pissed, he goes, he gets out of his car, he swings on him for making him fishtail. I done in, that. In the, turn, on, in the bank. <laughs> Dude, and that, that is how I became a fan of NASCAR because I didn't know anything about it, but an altercation, and two, it, it might have been you. I, I don't think it was. But dude got out the car, and he sucker punched dude for making him wreck. That'd be and me. That was you? That'd be me. This was a while ago. Joey, Joey Logano. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, that you see him dive that, on Joey? That was you. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. But it was a while ago, though. It was 20, um, when was that? 20, yeah, maybe 2016, 2017, somewhere in there. No, this is before that, though. To that point, what? But, so. Like, I, the guy didn't say anything to the guy, right? Like, he just walked no, down he pit road and, and just, he just hit him. That's it. That was me, yeah. Yeah. What qualifies? Because you said you said Dale done done some dirty shit to you on the on the, you know out there on the racing and all. What qualifies for an ass whooping and just qualifies for being mad? <laughs> when you when you flat out wreck me on purpose and I know it. But how can you know? How do you know? Going oh, I fucking know. How? At oh, the, I I fucking know. At that speed, how can you tell it's not a mistake yeah. though? Oh, I know. Well, you got to give. We want we want to know. Well, how. I'll tell you how. So it was the last lap of the race and. Uh, we're, I caught Joey from a ways back, and we're side by side going down the back straightaway. And his teammate, Brad Kozlowski, is in front of him, who Kozlowski. is his down a cylinder. He's, his engine's blowing up, so he's slow. So I'm alongside of Joey, and I, I inch ahead just a little bit, and I see that. And Joey wants to pin me behind Brad so I don't pass him. This is for third place. Like, it's not for a win or right. anything. Like, it's in third place, right? <laughs> So we're going on a backstretch. Well, I, I wag a little bit towards him, turn towards him, and, and we touch a little bit. So I build room so I can get by Brad. And we both enter the corner just fine. Like nothing, nothing was wrong, right? Well, Joey's a little bit behind me. I'm a little bit here. And I left him room, but I could hear him because the exhaust pipe's right on the right rear, right in front of the right rear tire. I heard him throttle up in the middle of the corner back to wide open throttle. And wah, boom, just doored me, drilled me in the door. And I spun all the way down the, the, the pit lane, and I'll, I just rolled past start finish, so I finished the race. And then I just stopped on pit road, and Joey went on, Joey finished third. I think I got credited for last on the lead lap, like 25th or something like that. So I knew he wrecked me. So I was pissed, and I was, and my, <laughs> My father-in-law, Samantha's dad, he, was, he grew up in the gym uh, when he was a kid and, and, and was a, a little bit of a fighter. And we were always kind of talking just fighting stories and stuff like that. And he goes, man, oh, he, so he's, he's seen the NASCAR fights. Like these NASCAR fights are wimp fights, right? Yeah, yeah. Like it's like a little bit of uh, 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 uh. And then somebody gets in and pulls them apart. Yeah, right. So he's like, I'm tired of seeing that shit. I want to see somebody just <laughs> go up and clock, clock a dude, you know? So I always remember that. I'm like, all right, do it. <laughs> so, so I get out of my, I never said anything on the radio, nothing to my team. Like, hey, come, come with me. Like, yeah. I'm going to go whip this boy's ass. Like, nothing. <laughs> Kept it all to myself. I got out of my car. I marched my happy ass down pit road. <laughs> and I turned right in to, to where he was. And I just pulled it back and let her rip. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> hit him right across the face, and then of course I got the one hit in because the whole rest of the fight was just all these dudes pulling us apart, right. and they they drug me to the ground, and I come up bleeding. I must have hit myself on the front of the car or something. <laughs> and uh, so, anyways, like yeah, that was that was that moment. And so NASCAR actually then got us together and took us into the hauler uh, before the next race happened, and we had a meeting. Well, during that during that week before we got to that meeting. I actually did. I texted, Logano called me to apologize, like, hey, I'm sorry, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, uh, I told him, I said, I want you to bring your data, because we have data in these cars. So it'll tell you steering, brake, gas, um, so you know what the driver's doing. Yeah. So I told him, I says, bring your data into this NASCAR meeting and we'll fucking talk about it. Yeah. So he brought it in there and sure as shit, there it was, back wide open in the middle of the corner. He, he throttled it. And he throttled it and fucking drilled me. And that, that, that stood out to me because here we are, we, we're doing over a hundred and whatever with Dell around the track. Yeah. And I, I'm in the car almost 
panicking. I'm like, <laughs> I'm trusting that he's a pro, you know, a, a legend. A he's goat. an old pro. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Though. No, well, you know, but he's a legend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm in there and I just hear, yeah, I can't hear nothing else, right? Yep. You said you can hear the throttle. In football, before they snap the ball, we hear the fans, but when they snap the ball, I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. right? It just goes complete silence. Right. And after the play, yeah. You heard him throttle. Yep. Like you guys in my just race car. While my race that, car is like, running, right? It's loud. I heard. Yeah. But you can hear, like, you can hear that on top of everything else. Yep. Do you hear the fans when you're going, or you just focus um, on your team? I mean, like under. No, you don't hear them. So, for instance, like Dale Jr. Right? When you would go to places and Dale Jr. would take the lead, <sighs> the crowd's roaring. You couldn't hear that in a car. You wouldn't hear the fans. No. That was a good question because that was one of the things that was. A thought that I had after I jumped out, because we did the NASCAR experience. We got in the car with Junior, and he took us around. Well, it was scary for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought about that. You know, there's times. Was it fun, though? It was, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. But it's a whole nother. You, you got to just watch the, the clips and see how I struggle, if you haven't already. But uh, there's times in games where you, you, you can look up and you can see, oh, that fan. You know, you make eye contact with somebody, or you can look up in the booth and see your family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, damn, do you guys have that moment going around so fast? And it's like, oh, like, that's pretty cool. Like, you, you kind of come out of it a little bit and... <clears throat> not, a, not, yeah, as, yeah. not as we're racing, no, but like, so we have, um, you know, they have the driver intro stage and you're out for driver intros and you wave to the crowd. This is pre-COVID. And you wave to the crowd and all that stuff and you take ride around the vehicles and stuff. So you get to see you know, people and stuff like that and their emotions and cheering for you or flipping you off or whatever it might be. Right. A lot more flipping me off. <laughs> um, but like there's a couple racetracks we go to too where they actually make signs like Kyle Busch is an asshole and, <laughs> and Kyle Busch does what blah, 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 like all this other stuff, you know, and so you, you see that stuff. Yeah, because like we were so locked in. We talked about it after we all went, went around the track a couple times. I was just so locked in on just what's in front of me, and I wasn't driving. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I mean, the last lap for me, I tried to look, like, where's the crew at, you know? We're about to cross the finish line, I think. Where are the guys at? I'm trying to look, finally, but I couldn't. It was, you guys were going so fast. And, and, and so that, you know, that's why that thought came up, because a lot of people don't understand how much power is in that car, mm -hmm. which you call, guys call it G-forces. G-forces, yeah. But you guys have G-forces, you know what that is. Yeah, but not, not like that. Like, that's just different, bro. Like, I got out and I was no, like, No, you guys' a, are worse. That's an airplane. I was just in an airplane. Like, literally, I was in an airplane. Um, Villain. Vi Who more? Huh? You mentioned it, but we didn't expound on it. But we're going to because I'm excited. Now you got me excited to know that you embraced the villain role. You're an asshole like I am. A nice house. It's okay to be nice. I but mean, my wife still loves me. That, you know what? Somebody does. That's, that's all that matters. <laughs> that's all that matters. Yep. But you said there are others that you are racing right now who you do have a similar relationship with early on in your career that you did with Dale. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to say who it is yeah. or who you don't like? Yeah, Joey Logano is number one. Still? Still? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bro, y'all need to get on the podcast. Yeah. What? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. He's... The problem with Joey is he's two-faced. So people know I'm an <laughs> so I might be a on the racetrack, which I'm really not. But Logano, like, he'll come in here and he's laughy and, and go lucky, go with the flow, like, super nice guy, all this stuff, does great for charity, everything like that. You put him on the racetrack, when he puts his helmet on, he flips the whole switch on the back of his head. <laughs> okay. So, to okay. me, that, like, I hate two faced guys. Like, that drives me absolutely nuts. Like, if you're going to be a nice guy, be a nice guy on the racetrack as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's just that, that fries me. And then his teammate, Brad Keselowski, him and I, we always. We always butt heads. Yeah, no Brad, no Brad. And that was the other reason why the Logano fight thing happened. So I actually took it out a little bit more on Logano because Brad and I, for years, have always run into each other, wrecked each other, whatever. Like that same thing where you don't give respect to that guy and don't give him that extra little bit of room. Me and Brad, we were never that way. So when Logano did that, I, I took out Brad-isms on, on Joey. <laughs> You know, in that in that moment. And the other thing that fried my ass on that, too, was because Joey, he was at Joe Gibbs Racing uh, back in his early days when he was a rookie um, for three years. And he only won one race in those three years. But, like, there was a meeting between us drivers and Joe and JD and Coy, the guys that were running the business. 
And they were like, well, we don't know what we're going to do with Joey, but it's not looking good. We might have to get rid of him. And I was like, man, I don't think so. It's, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. Like, I, I don't think, like I was vouching for Joey. You know what I mean? And then fast forward, that happened. Like, you don't just, right. you don't just do that to a guy that had your back back in the day. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. Are, are you open to next time we come out to Charlotte, you and Joey sitting down with us and y'all talking it out and hashing out? I don't think it'll get talked out. You might as well wait till we're both retired. No, or at no, least no, one of now, us no, now. Are you open <laughs> to- Why do you want to settle it now? Why not just let us to each other on the track. It's a better it, it show It makes for the you. sport fun. It makes it, it makes it, it makes it more fun. Don't try to end. Well, well, we need to get Joey. We need to get Joey. Let me ask you, bro. You're a Broncos fan. Yeah. You may be the you may be the Jay Cutler of football. I mean, obviously you're more accomplished, right? That's obvious, bro. Why doesn't people understand you? And the reason why I compare you to Jay Cutler is because perception and I just, it's, it's perception reality is he's smoking Jay Cutler, but the people in his circle absolutely love him walking around this empire and people like love him you know you driver 15 years ago you know you got people around you your dad uncle greg your son's guy mm -hmm. right yep is perception reality or like, right. what are we missing no it's it's definitely a lot of that yeah no i i've i've seen that for years and i've i've always I've seen the, the, the fan or the media persona around Jay, and I feel like he kind of gets a, a bad rap of it because then I pay attention to what the, the players do around him. Right. And I always kind of see there's a different take with the players with him, and I'm like, okay, there's an inner circle thing there. He's, way, he's not who these are making him out to be. He's, he's different. Right. Um, I even had a conversation with Kyle Long uh, about him, you know, when, yeah. when he went to the Bears. Well, he went to the Bears too. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that was... Um, same kind of thing, you know, I feel like when I came into NASCAR in 2003, I ran my first Xfinity Series race, the yep. Series 2. Are we learning, we're learning. And my brother had been in the sport since 2000. Well, he had been making a name for himself, not so great of a name, like wrecking some people, getting into it with some veteran guys. Too. He was an asshole too. Just a punk kid, right? We're both punk kids from Vegas. Mm -hmm. And not coming up the the, uh, the from the south kind of way and being a little older and earning your chances, you're basically just giving it, getting it given to you on a silver platter type thing, right? So Kurt made a name for himself, not so good. So my first race in, in 2003, I was booed, like a driver intros. And I was like, wait a second, like, hold on. It's not Kurt, y'all, this is Kyle. Yeah. You know, but it, it didn't matter. I was guilty by association. So that's when I was kind of like the, Whatever. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do me and and however that is and yeah, it was a little rough to start so that that kind of gave me a, a bad taste in in people's mouths but uh, I've turned it around a little bit since then. And next next year, they're kind of even the they're even in the playing field with the next gen car, the engine. So regardless of who you run, what company you're with, no matter how much money you guys have, the playing field with all 40 cars is gonna be somewhat equal. Yep. What do you think about that next year? I don't like it. I'm, I'm in a slump right now. I don't know what it is, but we gotta figure it out. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, okay, cause you're gonna get into that too? I wanted to. Okay, yep. great, We're thanks. <laughs> so, get the hell out. So, uh, <clears throat> here, here's my X-Man over here. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> next year, the next gen next car. gen car. Okay, I don't like it just because the fact of <clears throat> you take out the craftsmanship of the manufacturers, of the teams, and all that sort of stuff on how you build speed. Like we might spend ten million dollars in building chassis, where the next guy might spend ten million dollars in building bodies. Mm. So there's you create separation, right? And you create good guys, bad guys, or fast cars, slow cars, whatever. There's the same thing in drivers. There's good drivers, there's bad drivers, you know what I mean? So um, they're trying to create parity, which I get, and some would argue the fact like, okay, well the good drivers are still gonna be the good drivers and they're gonna excel. And yeah, I believe in that. I think that's still gonna come, come through, but it's going to be harder and slower to do. The more the cars are equal, the harder it is for us to pass and make moves and things like that and, and, and put on a good show, in my opinion. So. so you think it will stand? So they'll probably just test this out for one season. Oh, hell no. No, this is, this is here to stay. Is it, is it a pivot by NASCAR to introduce like more younger, you know, younger guys into the sport? Like younger give them, drivers? Younger drivers to give them a, a, a more, a fairer opportunity. Um, you know, cause a lot, I know the NFL with their rule changes, 
to score more, that was a, a, a straight one, a 90 degree pivot by them to, to excite the fans more and to sell the game more. Right. You know, fans so get ex fans ain't excited when you see a zero zero game. They're not they're not cool with the defense. Right, winning. they want to score more. So yeah, that's they want to see offense scoring did. points. So right? in your sport, you know, is there a, like a, the following with Instagram, social media, oh, yeah. the younger people? Yeah. You know, they it's just a sexier look. They don't always want to cheer for the older guy. Yeah, and I don't think you know. the car has much to do with that as much as the show has to do with that. So like years ago, they introduced this um, uh, the stages. Right, so now you have these stages, so it cuts up the race a little bit. We get awarded points at the end of these stages, so it, it's meaningful to us drivers to excel throughout the whole race rather than just at the end of the race. So there's more pressure on us to do better the whole race because those points, they help you throughout the entire year. And if you win stages, those points help you through the playoffs and get you to the championship round. So that sort of stuff was to entice the fans' uh, excitement and, and get them more into following an entire event or throughout the season. And honestly, I don't know that it's done a whole lot. I think we're pretty flat, you know what I mean? Um, some would argue too, like back in 2000, 2001, that era, like right before Dale Sr.'s death, that was the high time in NASCAR, like TV ratings were boom. And now we're just kind of floating around a little below that. So, you ready? All right, what up? All right, yeah, because the seat that I occupy on this show, sometimes I get a little messy, okay? <laughs> Fred, you got to watch his number, so when he said 90 degrees, you'll see all of our eyes like, we got to, is it right, is it right? <laughs> Ocho versus science, Chan just Chan. All right, I get a little messy here. But it is out there. I mean, you, 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 we, it came up organically, but <clears throat> for years, you know, every week it's, where's Kyle, where's Kyle? He could be number one, winning. Over the last races, maybe two wins, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Okay. And there's a lot of talk back then you were able to go like you're one, you were one of those guys racing the trucks, doing Xfinity. So you were hitting it, had more laps around. Now they're limiting that. And then they're also because of COVID practice where you qualify, that's not there. So is it that or is something else going on? You know, like, cause you said we got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So where are you at in that process? Yeah, so you, you brought up all great points. So years ago, 20, I don't know, since 2008, 2008, yeah, to, since 2008, um, I've pretty much run 30 Xfinity Series races, 15 truck races, 38 cup races. So what's that? That's like 85 races, let's call it, right? And then they made a rule in 2015 or 16 where you're only allowed to run um, five, if you're a Cup Series driver for over three years, you're only allowed to run five truck races and five Xfinity races. That's it. It's the Kyle Busch rule because I was out there winning everything in all the lower divisions and the upper division. Like there was a year, might have been 2010 or 11, I won 24 races across all three series. That's the most ever. The, the next closest guy is Kevin Harvick. I think he won 12. Yeah. Wow. So, um, they made, a, they made a rule for me that, that I can only run in five extra races past all of my cup races. And so that kind of took a little bit from me, but I didn't really slow down winning cup races. I still won five, eight races a year, whatever it might be in, in the cup series, which is five is a good year. That's, that's what I always attribute to a good year is, is five wins. Um, and I did that for you know, 16, 17, 18. I, I won that many races in those years. And then 19, I won four races in the first... 10 and then didn't win again until the championship race at the end of the year which gave me my five wins on the year but man it it felt like right. death mm -hmm. not winning from june until november you know um and then 2020 happened where you took away practice so there's no practice you're not you're not out there running two hours at a time dialing your car in and setting it up and getting everything how you want it for how i drive the car how i like to drive the car and so you basically you unload with whatever the engineers think is a good setup. They put it on the grid and you fire off for the race. Well, if your car unloads, <clears throat> let's go pre-COVID. If your car unloads, let's say it's 80% of the way there pre-COVID. Well, we have practice. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to get it 10 more percent during practice. So we're going to get to 90. And then during the rest of the race, we're going to work on it some more and we're going to get it to 95. So I got a 95% car for the end of the race. I can win with that. 
Right. You know what I mean? It don't have to be perfect. Give me 95, I'm going to win. Well, now <clears throat> we're showing up with that same 80% car at the start of the race, right? We're 80% of the way there. Well, through the first stage, stage and a half, I might get us 5% because we, can't, we can only adjust air pressure, um, wedge, which is rounds in the rear window, and track bar. That's it. That's it. That's it. Like you can't go into the garage area, change a spring, change where your truck arms are, change the shocks, change the sway bar, like all the stuff that makes a car a car and how fast you can go, you can't really change that stuff. So if I unload and start the race at 80% and I only get to 87%, I'm probably not going to win at 87%. Right. You know, so there's been a couple races though where we've unloaded and we've unloaded with a 90% car and we improved it to that 95 and boom, we won. Right. That was last year at Texas. We unloaded and we were, we were okay to start. I was really loose, but as soon as we tweaked that loose out of it and we got it driving good, boom, to the lead, led the most laps of the race, won the race, you know? And then this year at Atlanta, we, we unloaded at Atlanta where we started the race at, at 90% and I took off. Like I went, I think I started 16th and I got up to fourth in the first run of the race. And, and Kyle won that one? Larson was going to win that, should have won that one, but he lost at the end because he burned his tires off. Uh, Ryan Blaney won it. Okay. So, but I was running second to Larson and Larson had like a 15 second lead or something. And I was running second. So I'm like, damn, how the hell am I going to find 15 seconds? <laughs> right, right. You know, like I'm, I'm like, we're pretty close. Like I felt like my car was 95%, but I had passed Ryan Blaney in that run to get to second where uh, Kyle Larson was checked out. But then the next time down pit road, we had a bad pit stop, a little bit slower of a pit stop. So I tried to make up for that deficit, racing a guy off a of pit road, and I got busted for speeding. So I had to go to the back. Right. So then I worked my way all the way back up through the field. I finished fourth, I think, yeah. you know, so, but I wasted, I wasted a chance at a win because I sped on pit road. No, right, spe so speaking, speaking of winning, I got a, a curious crowd. I'm going to use a Brady Belichick analogy. And when it comes to winning, as you mentioned, and you've won a lot, as you can see, who's the Brady and who's the Belichick? Is it the crew chief or is it the driver? Mm. Who's really winning the race? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is it? Is the I driver mean, Brady? The drivers, are, the drivers are the quarterbacks. Okay, and so the crew chief is And the crew chief is the head coach. No question. Yep. Really? That's how it is. So you can have, there's, I call it three or maybe even four tiers of drivers. Hey, remember I mentioned the tiers yesterday? Yep. yep. Okay, never mind. Sorry, sorry. Yep. I just got excited. So there, there's four tiers of drivers. There's A, B, C, and D. There's probably four four, maybe five A tier guys. There's probably six to seven B tier guys. And then there's six to seven C and six to seven Ds. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that, that, that's how I look at that. Crew chiefs, you can kind of go the same way. Like there are five really, really good crew chiefs. Like if you could ever have a chance to work with one of these three, five crew chiefs, you would take that guy all day long. No problem. That's like, I don't know if that's a Belichick now. Obviously we've kind of proven. No, he's still there. I mean, yeah, but so, but that's my point. So like if you have an A crew, crew chief and you have a B driver, you're, you're going to be pretty right. good. Yeah. If you've got a B crew chief and an A driver, you're going to be pretty good. You're going to be right there. When you have an A and an A, sky's the limit, dude. Yeah. Your guy's an A? My guy right now, he's a rookie right now, so I'm not going to give him an A right now. No. Oh, you're tough. You're tough. I am. All right. Let me. Let me. Am I an A? Am I an A? Yeah, you're, you're an A. You're, of course you're an A. You, you want to go out with us? Huh? <laughs> you want to go to Whiskey River? Junior will pay for it. Let's, Let's go. Let's take 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. He just offered you, to did, take you, us you out. Had something? You had a good one? Yeah. I was going to say. I offered on behalf of Junior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. I'll go, though. You're an A now. Will, will you know when you're a B and a C? Well, the retirement of a NASCAR driver. When did that happen? I won the championship in 19. I don't feel like I've lost anything. Like, I don't feel as though I'm worse behind the wheel. I do feel like my days are more challenging. Like, starting a race back in 12th and, and working your balls off to just get to 10th by the first stage, but them continuing to make changes to your car, and now all of a sudden you can drive up to 4th, what does that tell you? That tells you you have to start closer. So the car has to be better off the truck. You know what I mean? Like, I can only carry it so far. Yeah. You, any driver can only carry it so far. So that's what I was saying. Like, if you have a good car, let's say if you have a 90% car and you have a D driver, you're going to finish 15th. 
if you have a 90% car and an A driver, you're gonna, you're gonna finish top three all day long. Could you admit that I'm in a good car, but it's not, that it's me? Would you, would would, you know would it, I admit that? at the time in your career when you're the problem? I'm not sucking. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Talk that shit. Let that's him fact. know. I, I, am, I, am, I ain't sucking right now, hell no. Cause that, that's interesting, cause we get, we get forced out of our sport. Yeah, right. Hey, no more contract for y'all. And it's Always. Over. Well, yeah, if I, if I don't win this year, I'm up for renegotiations next year, you, think you know? So that, they'll, either, they'll either say, hey, you're going to take a whatever pay cut in order to stay, or you can go find something else to do. So May is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, and uh, it, it touches all of us. Um, you know, 320 million Americans, give or take, I don't even know ex where we're at right now. Uh, almost 100 million Americans deal with something there. I'm curious to hear how IVF and where you and Samantha is in that mm -hmm. process. Like, yep. how is that here? And what's the story behind? That ain't easy. Right. Yeah, it's, it's tough. So uh, IVF in vitro fertilization process to be able to have children, it's, it's, not as, it's definitely not as fun as the old fashioned natural way. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of doctor's visits. My wife even made a joke one time to, uh, to some of her friends was like, yeah, the day I got knocked up, my husband didn't even touch my vagina. <laughs> you know, so right. it's like, well, right. yeah, that, that happened. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so who is the baby daddy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a challenge because like when you go to the doctor and you're asking questions and you don't get answers, like, man, it, it's, it's tough. But then you get those answers and it's like, oh, okay, good, we have answers. We went through our first IVF process with our son. We had Brexton. It was no problem. Everything went smooth sailing. Everything was good. Well, now, since then, Samantha and I, we've gone through to try to have a baby girl. Uh, she miscarried on the, the, the second embryo. The third embryo didn't even take, like just like never even happened. And then we went through a surrogate with the fourth one and that embryo didn't even take. Wow. So then we went to another clinic and went through the, the egg retrieval process again and that whole thing, which puts you out, you know, three months of, of uh, just timing. Um, but we got, you know, five healthy, um, very viable girl embryos to try again. Through this whole process, you know, it's like, oh great, okay, we're gonna try again, let down, defeat. Okay, great, we're gonna try again, let down, defeat. It's like. When does it end? So Samantha has shots every night. I have to give her shots. And so <clears throat> that's a brutal part for the woman. But the, so the numbers kept going up, they're elevating. And so it's now week six and you're supposed to be able to go in and see um, under an ultrasound whether or not you're pregnant. So we go in week six, the lady's looking around, checking everything out and she's like, oh, well, there's a sack there, but there's nothing in it. Yeah, what does that mean? What, what, what is that? You know, so like we're, we're all excited, like her numbers are, well, you get implanted, so you're excited. Then your numbers are flat and you're like, oh, defeated, right? Then that number jumps up and you're like, oh, we're excited, there's a chance. And then you go to the doctor for an ultrasound and the doctor's like, well, there's a sack, but there's nothing in it. So now you're like, oh, defeated. Like what is going on? Like this cycle, dude, has been nuts. It's like, ugh, like just, you just wanna know, right? When you want something really bad, and you want it, you want it, it never seems to come out right. But the minute you be like, you know what? If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. All of a sudden, boom, you get great news. I so, mean, that, that's one way I've uh, always dealt with things mentally, you know, right. when, when, it, when stuff is up and down because you get no directions yeah, how, right. how to deal with this stuff. So there's a lot of uh, men and women and couples that follow our, our show. Um, and, and, and it's one of those conversations we don't have a lot. So just is, give hope. You know, what would you say to the yeah, couples out there that's get, dealing I, with this, the women out there that's dealing with this? What would Samantha say? Yeah, so, well, Samantha had a really rough time with the, the, the miscarriage and then the failed cycle. Like, it was, it was really hard, you know. Um, but since then, we've kind of led down more of the path of what Chad said, where if it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't. Like, it's not in our hands. Yeah. Like, as much as you would think science can have a hold on something and to be able to figure it out, right. The Almighty God is way higher than anything oh my, else. Thank you for saying that. Can we please clip that? <laughs> thank you for saying that. 
Yeah. I have to use that. I have to use that. But but I want to I want to end with this, man, because you you know you guys and really Samantha introduced me to the sport. You were nice enough after to say hello, shake my hand, take pictures. We exchanged info. You know we that was... talk often. But um, you're a real asshole, bro. Thank you. Yeah, 2007, you wrecked your brother, and I just want to end with this. Oh, like, you wrecked awesome. your brother. No, yes, you did. You That's wrecked awesome. Kirk. No, it's you okay. Wrecked your brother. My brother. And your grandmother me, made and you he talk to him. Finally admitted it on my 200th win party. He did. I won oh, he admitted races, it. By he admitted the way. it. He admitted it. <laughs> oh, yeah. He did. My brother finally admitted that he wrecked me in that crash. So like you, it. it was God an all-star it. race. I like yeah. it. I like it. It was an all-star race. You guys were racing. 2007. 2007 racing for million dollars. I was an idiot. Right. But yeah, that was in May. Yeah. You guys didn't talk till Thanksgiving. Grandma had to sit y'all down. Oh no, it was the following Thanksgiving. Longer. Oh, a year? Yeah. You didn't. A year? You're an a year plus. You're an a bro. That's so awesome. So he wrecked me in May. Right. We skipped Thanksgiving that year. It right, didn't right. Happen <laughs> that year. Yeah. So Grandma, the next year around for Thanksgiving was like, I'm not going to two Thanksgivings. I have my. I want my grandsons to to mend and make up, right. so I only have to go to one because she didn't want to go to two. It's like, <laughs> kids, two Christmases! <laughs> I like it. All right, man, appreciate it. You're an asshole. We got something for you, bro. We absolutely love your movement. Like Ocho was saying earlier, we're all doing things off the field, now to retire you off the track. Um, we love what you're doing with Rowdy. We have Lou here, who's a comedian, ex-football player. You know, the world loves him right now. and. You know, we want to support you. We want to give you a free commercial. You don't have to pay Lou, um, <laughs> but he wants to shoot a commercial for you that you can then take. You can put it out there on social media. You can also maybe put paid behind it, you know, and put it on, you know, Sweet. television, on yeah, the network. Right on. So, awesome. This is Lou. What's up? Lou, you, you know Kyle Man, Rowley. How's it going? Am I standing? You want me to stand? No, 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 just give me a little selfie real quick. Everybody back home. <laughs> Mom, dude's gonna love it. Awesome. That's right, that's right. Look, man, I see you got the, the, the Rowdy Row, right? Is it cool if I call it Rowdy Row? Rowdy what? Rowdy Row. If you got a frown, turn it upside down. Drink Rowdy Row. Mmm, shit. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you guys a trip. <laughs> you, you know what he proved today? For the people at home watching, it's the way I ended the show last time. And here's a prime example where being the villain is okay. Embrace it. Look around. Okay? Success is what you see. You can smell it. Cow bush, bitch. <laughs> KFBB. 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 <laughs> oh. My man. <laughs> Do you manscape? Yeah. Okay, okay he she manscapes looks, yeah. already. He manscapes. Have you ever heard the phrase, grind my testicles? I have not heard that phrase, no. That's new. It is. <laughs> what, what was it? How do you say it? Grind my what? Grind my, my gears. gears. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. You said my something bad. earlier that brought that up. Okay. Oh, you said heat so you were laughing my, on the side. Heat under my ass, or what'd you call <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. Heat under my, oh, fire under my ass or something? Yeah. He says, grind my testicles. It was a mistake. <laughs> I meant to say grind my gears, but I got mixed up with testicles because I sent out a tweet about giraffe testicles earlier because I was doing an experiment. Never mind. <laughs> Is that a science thing again? Yeah, it's bullshit. Because of the science shit, because of this one here, right. he keeps eating this fucking plant shit, plant dietary, and he's still fucking hurt every fucking two weeks. Don't it's something listen to different. him. Thank you. Appreciate you. No problem. Hey, That's Chef Nancy or Chef, good. give this to um, your crew. All right, some yeah. her seasonings. That's Chef Nancy. Okay, cool. And then the team at House of Athlete put together a little care package for you, bro. Nice. Love you. Appreciate Sweet. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Save them balls. Yeah. Yeah.